In the world of Minecraft computers, a decoder is a pretty vital component that is used pretty much everywhere in the computer. And as such an important component, it is understandable that most people have tried to create a suitable design for one. The most commonly used design is, as far as I'm aware, this one. It's a fairly easy design to make as it consists only of a few lines of redstone, some torches, and of course a easy to build staggering pattern that can be stacked with repeaters and redstone in between. And it's fairly compact with both the inputs and the outputs being as close together as possible. And for what it's worth, it is fairly fast. However, because this design requires repeaters between each line, the larger the decoder is, the longer the delay is. Many have tried to rectify this problem by laying its design on its side, though the only problem with this is, even though it increases in speed, you oftentimes lose the compactness that the original design has. For example, you'll notice that this one no longer has its inputs right next to each other. They are in fact spaced three blocks apart. This design by Codecrafted isn't too bad, though. It's, uh, it is a little taller than the original design, and the outputs are spaced a little bit further apart, but the inputs are still as close together as they can possibly get. Others have tried to address the problem of keeping the inputs and outputs close together and the time delay minimal by stacking the decoder vertically. Some designs use torch pillars like this one, but of course the torches add a little bit of a delay, so what other people have done is they have created glowstone staircases like this, which does eliminate the delay, but this particular design is only useful in a handful of applications, mainly when the device you're trying to address is stacked vertically. Now for a while, the best solution was a piston-based decoder, which offered the best of all worlds, keeping the inputs and outputs as close together as possible and keeping the delay between each decode line as small as possible. Now these did in fact work, very reliably I should say, well, for the most part, up until quasi-connectivity was introduced into the game, and they stopped being reliable. So, to try and correct the problem that pistons have introduced, most have reverted back to solid-state decoders, such as this design by Benny Cube. Now, even though this design works, it still has the problem that we are currently facing, and that is, we can either make the delay between each decode line as small as possible, or we can make the inputs or outputs as close together as possible, but we simply cannot achieve both. Another example of this is a uh, another design that both myself and Koala Steamed have come up with. Uh, this is a design that, uh, although is lower in profile, and the outputs are as close together as possible, and there is a minimal delay between each line, as a result, the inputs are spanned three blocks apart. So it doesn't seem like there's really any way around this. It seems like the area that a single decoder bit needs to take will always be fixed. However, that hasn't stopped me from trying to create my own decoder designs that address these problems. And if you'll allow me, I'd like to show you them. This first design I came up with is fairly similar to Benny Cube's design, uh, although it is a lower profile design. I specifically designed it this way so that you can easily stack these decoders one on top of the other. Uh, what's more, you may have also noticed that the outputs are spaced three blocks apart, even though they could in fact be spaced two apart. The reason for these design choices is that I actually designed this decoder specifically to go with SwiftX16's dual read memory. Since each uh, memory cell is four blocks in length, this means that where one enable bit starts, four blocks later is the next. Building a decoder like this is fairly straightforward. Uh, we simply start with the output wire going across like this, and then adding an extra piece of redstone a block back to every other block. Then we simply create the input by going a block up above that, one in front, one in back, and then one down, making sure that our input isn't directly above the one piece of redstone that we set back. Then we do that again for every input, and place redstone on top like so. Now to get the output to be active when a bit is zero, we simply place a repeater right underneath the line so that it connects with the block and to the output line. But to get it to activate when the input is a one, we simply put a torch right here so that it powers the redstone that we have set back here. 
Now because this is an active low signal, if you're wanting it to be active high, you will need to put it through an inverter. But now when a certain combination is entered, in this case we've programmed it to be 0, 1, when 0, 1 is entered on the inputs, the output is a 1. If any other combination is input, however, the decoder output will not activate. Stacking the design is as simple as taking this design right here and stacking it as many times as you like, say three times, and then reprogramming each line so that it takes on a different combination. Now you may be asking yourselves, why did I choose to put the torch here rather than here, as this is just as good of a spot? Well, the reason being is because we want to actually make sure that we have room for repeaters should the line ever stop short. We can't exactly put it here because there's no way that the line can actually get to it. And we could put it here, but the problem with that is if the torch is back here, that means that there's a difference in delay between this point and this point. And ideally, we'd want this delay to be the same, just for simplicity's sake. So for that reason, I put the torch here, so that when we put a repeater here, it doesn't matter if a torch is here or a repeater is down here, the delay between the two points remains exactly the same. The next design I want to show you is actually no more advantageous than this, other than the fact that it's actually a little easier to program. The reason why is, after having used a decoder like this, it gets a little bit confusing keeping track of which side to put the torch on. Now, that doesn't mean that it's impossible, but it does get a little bit tedious. So with this design, I made sure that if the line is supposed to be off, you were to place a repeater, and if the line is supposed to be on, you were to replace a torch. This just makes it a little bit easier to program. To build this decoder, it's fairly straightforward. You simply want to build two blocks out like this, and then skip the next block, or if you're building in the air, place a block one below, then a block above, one block below, and two more across like that, and go ahead and place redstone all across your line, like so. Then you're going to want to go one block up, make sure you go a block out, just for stack sake, and same on the other side, and over here you simply want to place one block above, you don't have to stack it though. Then go ahead and take some half slaps and place them between these two blocks, then go one down and take out the original, and then finally place redstone along, like so. Now, same story as before, if you want the input to be a zero when it's active, you simply place a repeater. However, if you want it to be a one, you have to place a torch. So with this particular design, again, it is active low, so you're going to want to invert it if you want it to be active high. And once again, this bit will only be active when the input is zero one. So if we go ahead and put in zero one, it's active, any other combination, and it doesn't work. Now, once again, stacking it is simply a case of taking this design and stacking it as many times as you like. Again, say three times. And then reprogramming each bit so that it's active with a different combination. Now, the nice thing about this design is it's fairly easy to add repeaters to the top line here, as they can simply be squeezed between each decode line. However, it's also easy to add a repeater on the lower line here, too, as stacking two of these decoders side by side means that there is exactly 15 blocks from this block to this block, which means we can simply add another repeater right there. And then we can simply take this design and stack it again. Now again, as far as the advantages versus disadvantages are, size-wise and in terms of input spacing and output spacing, it's pretty much identical to this one. The only disadvantage is it's a little bit more complicated to build, However, the advantage is it's easier to uh, program each output. Now, these are very good special purpose design decoders for various different applications. However, neither one of these addresses the problem that I mentioned earlier, which is keeping the inputs and outputs together as close as possible and mitigating the delay between each decode line. And for the longest time, I also thought that this might never be a reality, considering that these were the only two designs that, as far as I was aware, I actually designed. That is until I was exploring Blue Wave again for the first time in ages, and I rediscovered a decoder that I had built for this computer that actually meets these properties. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce you to the Lost Decoder.
Now, right off the bat, you may notice that it is a little taller than most other decoders, so it's not too terribly friendly when it comes to stacking. But if your needs require that your outputs all be as close together as possible, and your inputs be as close together as possible, this decoder might very well be the solution. Now, to build this decoder is fairly similar to the way we built the last decoder, in that we simply go across two blocks, go down one block, then over another block, down a block again, and then finally two blocks, making sure to knock these blocks out so that we get this nice staggered pattern. Redstone across the top like so. Then two blocks on either end, like so, with redstone on top of that. A block in the middle, and finally an upside down half slab in between those blocks, like so. So far, so normal. However, in case you're wondering what the difference is, Believe it or not, it's not anything too terribly special. All I did was I actually took this design for a decoder, which is already spaced three apart, and slipped it underneath. The cleverness, I guess, behind this is that this decoder can actually work from the top while the other works from the bottom, and as a result, they both kind of meet in the middle. So to add this, we're simply going to add our two lines down below, making sure to extend this one out just for OCD sake. And we're going to go one, two, three blocks below, take out those blocks, and bring this back. Likewise, on the other side, right below this middle block, we're going to go one, two, three blocks below, take those out, and bring this block back. And then we're going to add our redstone dust here. We're going to then add a block over here on each one, adding a repeater. Oops. And then we're going to stagger up our blocks, one up like that, and then one over like this, doing that on both sides. Programming each bit is fairly straightforward once again. If you want it to be a zero, you add a repeater. And if you want it to be a one, you add a torch. Down here, though, it's similar to the old school designs for decoders in that if you want it to be a zero, you add two torches like this. And if you want it to be a one, you add one torch like this. And if you want the delay to be the same, you simply add another tick to the repeater over here. The next step is to simply stack this design as many times as you like and then reprogram each bit so that it's active with a different combination. And then finally we want to bring these inputs together. Now we do that by first adding a repeater to the input of each line. Then we simply bring up the lower lines to about the same height as the decoder's output, just like so. And then same thing with the inputs for the top decoder, bringing it back one and then down and they should meet right about here. Go ahead and add redstone to the top of the inputs, add uh, whatever input means that you have to the inputs, and if you need be, invert the outputs so that they are active high once again. And you now have a functioning, fairly compact decoder. Now, I'll be honest, I had completely forgotten about this decoder when I had designed it, and I kind of wish I hadn't, because had I known about this decoder, a lot of my more modern computers would be a lot smaller in design. Uh, but now that I've rediscovered it, you can pretty much bet your bottom dollar that I'm going to be using this everywhere that I can. But hopefully, this particular decoder design, even though it is fairly tall in stature, should suit your needs for whatever decoder need you may have. Now, am I saying that you guys should only use my decoder designs? No, not at all. There are certain situations where other decoder designs may be stronger in certain scenarios. For example, I have had a few cases where I've actually used this decoder design, even though it's old school, uh, simply because it is actually more beneficial. Uh, say, for example, if I'm using a small decoder, this is actually a lot better. But as a redstone computer developer, and I'm sure you are as well, you'll know that it's a lot better to have options available. So I figure the more designs there are out there, the better. That said, if you did use my design and you liked it, uh, be sure to leave a like on the video. It is much appreciated. Otherwise, if you want to be notified when I post more videos like these, be sure to hit subscribe and make sure that bell is ringing, and I will see you guys in the next video. Bye!